Du lyssnar på dekonstruktiv kritik i julkalender. Jag är Aron Flam. Idag ska vi se vem eller vad som döljer sig bakom lucka nummer åtta. Nej men, är det en digital lynchmob? Ja, det är det. Sweden has been more blessed or cursed, depending on your point of view, by the Me Too phenomenon than any other country on earth. If you don't believe me, please look in the description below this episode on Patreon. There is a link to Patreon in the description below this episode, regardless what platform you're listening on. Please take the time. I urge you, because I fear my description will not do it justice. There you will see a Google Trends map of the entire world, mapping out country by country the Google statistic for the search term Me Too. Countries range in color from grey to different shades of blue according to how much the search term is used. Sweden is Yvklein blue. When I'm first shown this picture, Sweden has the value 100. And in a distant second place looms the Netherlands with only 38 points. A drab blue so boring it's hard to look at. Two days later Sweden is still at 100 and now Norway has taken second place with a score of only 17. Norway is approaching grey while we are still the color of a very healthy smurf, proving Sweden is uniquely affected by the Me Too phenomenon. It is astounding and a bit embarrassing. In Denmark, they just laugh at us Swedes. They call what is going on here svenskerier, Swedishness. If it sounds a bit like craziness, it's supposed to. That's the point. So how come the most feminist country in the world at the same time have the most rapes and sexual harassment? After all, we have a feminist government, According to itself, the first feminist government ever. We have a feminist foreign policy, and we gave women the vote before any other country on earth. So how can a country that has included gender perspective in school from kindergarten to university and beyond be the most misogynistic? The usual argument for this is, the fact that Sweden is the most progressive country in the world might make us a bit more open to talk about things like this, and that we, because of this, have a high reported rate than most other countries who naturally are equally bad or most probably worse. And sure, that could explain some of the phenomenon. But over 650 Swedish singers signed a Me Too petition. Over 450 actresses. When the actresses gathered for a large manifestation at the city-run theater in Stockholm, members of the royal family was there. As the actresses read confessions of harassment and abuse they had been subjected to in their workplace, it was televised and held in English for the whole world to see. I really hope you watched it. Over 4,500 lawyers have their own petition, which sounds like quite a lot, but I checked the numbers and apparently SACO, an organization for lawyers, says there are 35,000 people working in the sector today and half of them are female, that's 17,500 and 4,500 of that is just about 25.7%. So maybe we should ask why 74.3% of female lawyers didn't sign the petition. Are roughly 75% of female lawyers pro-rape and sexual harassment? And now more than 4,000 journalists have signed their own petition. At public service, that's what we Swedes call our state-owned television and radio channels. The journalist clubs in all branches are calling to workshops where their petition will be read every half hour. Come, read, think and battle sexism and different forms of harassment with us. Individuals of all genders are welcome. We that arrange this are the club chairman of SVT, UR and SR. That's the different branches of TV, educational programming and radio. And then it goes on. And we would very much want to form a task force to continue to work on this question. Since the 14th of November, the unions are involved promising to battle sexual harassment business sector by business sector. Apparently 60% of the young female workers in the industrial sector have been sexually harassed. 60%. At least according to the Metal Workers Union chairperson, Marie Nilsson, an astoundingly high figure, especially to happen on a female boss's watch, one could note. On the 16th of November, the state prosecutor officially recognized the importance of the Me Too campaign for the justice system itself, thus suspending habeas corpus, which, among other things, would guarantee you the right to know what you are accused of and who your accuser is, a fundamental principle in most Western justice system, but rather new to Sweden, I'm afraid. Though it has been made into Swedish law by the European Convention of Human Rights. It was made into law 1994, colon, 1219. Now, it's null and void. 
And sure, there are a few voices that are concerned that this might be creating an informer society. A society where anyone can accuse anyone else of being a rapist or a deviant, where lynch justice rules the land. Reactionaries who don't understand that the moment is finally here, the perfectly equal and just society is just around the corner. All it needs is this little, final push. We're doing it to get rid of sexual predators, after all, and if that costs a few wrongful accusations, a few people who get fired to never find work again, a few more innocent lives ruined in the process, then so be it. Utopia will have been worth it. But it still doesn't answer the question why Sweden, the most feminist country in the world, is at the same time the country most plagued by hatred against women. We have been applying gender science in schools, modulating female behavior to be more like boys, to break the norms, and boys to be, well, less like boys for 30 years now. And sure, the boys' grades are lower than ever. They even suck at math and physics now, but the girls are fucking awesome, so it's not like we haven't sacrificed for feminism. We have gender certified the military, the police department, medicine. Don't ask me how, but apparently biology finally came around to the Swedish way of looking at it. And why is it first and foremost women in media and entertainment and law? Powerful women with high education, part of our elites, that seem to have the worst problems. These people, after all, belong to the most privileged group of people that ever lived. And why now? Sweden has, after all, had a real rape epidemic for a few years now, not talked about, not demonstrated against, no hashtags or task forces or group hugs. For decades, women in the suburbs have been complaining of moral police roaming the streets to make sure they cover up and behave like proper women. When a woman in a wheelchair was raped by migrants in a toilet stall in Gotland and the locals started protesting for justice, the media, the entertainment industry and the justice system called them a lynch mob and racist. And maybe they were. But what in that case is the difference? I think that it is precisely because of this that we're in our current situation. Now, sex is the driving force and the most dangerous drive in human nature. Almost everything we do is subconsciously done for procreation. Basically, we're all horny animals. It is not pretty. We want it to be pretty, which is why we invented romance, to make it look pretty, but it's not. Before Freud, human sexuality was frowned upon. Both male and female had to hide their sexual urges, deny that they were sexual beings, which wasn't very healthy either and not much fun. Freud's theories helped, for lack of better words, to liberalize sex. From being shameful and base to something to be enjoyed and celebrated. Hooray! No longer was it the priests or your family that decided who you should have sex with, but you, you got to decide for yourself. Now, the only way this could work was that everyone saw themselves as an individual and took personal responsibility for their actions. Not that it really matters. Every advancement, every attempt at friendship or love, in every culture, in every time, is always a sort of negotiation. I like you, do you like me, can I give you something, can I touch you there, can I put this fist here, you know. Never more so than in the Western world from Freud and on, ever since the sexual liberation it is incumbent on every individual, regardless of gender or sexuality, to take responsibility for their own actions, and to listen, and to apologize if necessary. And if you really love someone, it will probably become necessary as you get to know each other better. The thing is, it is a huge grey area. Some things you thought you'd like, you won't. And some things you thought you'd hate, you might end up craving the most. Like moulded cheese. But if you make mistakes, take it with the person you wronged, if it's not too serious. It is only children who always need grown-ups to intervene. And grown-ups who want the state to intervene in their sex lives, well, let's just say I will reserve my judgment. The hippie cry from 1968 for free sex was something else. That was not free sex. They wanted to free sex from responsibility, which was doomed to failure. As I told you, the human sex drive is a dangerous animal. It has to be well trained or kept on a leash. What Me Too and the new definitions of what constitutes sexual harassment does is a direct attack on free sexuality, or like one of my female friends called it, life. It's an attack on life. Because that's what that grey area is. The things that aren't black or white, where disappointment and hurt and shame lies, but also excitement, creativity and novelty. I have been watching this movement since I first encountered it in my early twenties. It made me wary because of its clear totalitarian ideology. I have reported on it and studied it as part of my profession. 
And they all believe in this triangle, like most conspiracy theorists, where everything is connected. At the bottom of the triangle is inappropriate jokes, sexist slurs, unconscious but norm-reinforcing behavior. And at the top is rape and murder. It's all part of the same structure, so if I laugh at a rape joke in Stockholm, then Cassandra gets raped in Syria by some sort of if a butterfly flutters its wings in China, there's a hurricane in Brazil type logic. Just in this campaign, I've seen one of the movement's leaders say on national TV that it's important that we view an unwelcome text message or joke as the same as rape because it creates the same feeling in what she calls the victim which is relativizing rape like hell. And she got to do it without the host asking a single critical question on state television funded by citizens. And like all extreme and or utopian movements, I'm not surprised that it has turned out like this. Tack för att du lyssnar på Dekonstruktiv kritik. Jag är Aron Flam. Vill du stötta Dekonstruktiv kritiks arbete och det vill du så kan du göra det på patreon.com slash aronflam. Patreon.com slash aronflam är ett ord. Via Paypal, med bitcoin eller på Swish 0768 94 37 37. 0768 94 37 37. Du kan och bör också köpa boken Det här är en svensk tiger och boken Älskade Public Service som jag skrivit tillsammans med Jens Gahnman. Till nästa lucka, det vill säga imorgon, ha en god tidsenhet.